my ancestors escaping slavery in the Old South, the stars were more than just a pretty distraction. The stars, and the North Star in particular, was a beacon leading them towards freedom. Escaping slavery meant using every tool that you could possibly use. Tree moss on bark grew towards the north, pointing towards freedom. A beacon, a velvet green light leading them towards their Canaan, their promised land. Slave songs, Bible stories, and spirituals became a method of covert communication. Everybody knew that Go down, Moses, way down to Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Was a song in celebration of a freedom fighter named Moses, a woman named Harriet Tubman. And when a song mentioned a train, it was code a way to celebrate the Underground Railroad. The first poem I'm going to share with you, I wrote for my great, great, great grandfather. It's called The Exodus of Cornelius Thompson. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory. Don't care nothing but the righteous and the holy. This train is bound for glory. This train. Born a slave on a West Virginian plantation, you practiced your escape daily, ran to the river over and over again, got shot twice during thwarted attempts at emancipation. You were whipped on the regular and still refused to turn a blind eye to the blatant injustice of plantation life. You refused to turn a deaf ear to the cries of your brothers, refused to allow the label slave to define your existence. They may have branded you like cattle, but they never found a way to get under your skin. What spark of light ignited you to leave behind your life, your children, your wife? What inspired the desire to leave everything behind, all for the gamble that one day you'd make it all the way up north to freedom? Dear great-great-grandfather, I wonder did you leave the field brazenly in the full light of day, or did you wait for nightfall to cover your departure? I wonder, how far did you get before they set the hounds loose? Did you hear them? Were you haunted by images of them tearing at your skin? Were you ever lost on that underground railroad path, wondering if you were on your own exiled adventure in the wilderness, your own 40 years of wandering, but without the gifts of manna, signs and wonders to keep you going? Did you ever give up and strike some barren, unsuspecting rock in pure frustration? Were you ever attempted to circle back to the familiar chains of your enslavement? Did you ever feel that you'd been abandoned? handed over to the unrestrained sadism of Satan like some cast-out-of-the-garden ill-fated plaything, cursed like Job with an assortment of tortures and seemingly unending malevolent misfortune? Were you suspicious of the unfamiliar Quakers who offered you food and shelter? Were you afraid their kindness was a trick? that it would lead with you being sold back into slavery again or hanging limp on some tree like some dangling token to ignorance? Or was the faith of those Quakers a factor in your own deliverance, your own grace-fueled decision to dedicate your life to God as an impassioned emissary of the Great Commission? What led you to make that sacred covenant? to cut a swath through the Red Sea of America, all with the hope that one day you'd make it to the relative safety of northern shores. What burning bush contained the call that made you become a Baptist minister to a flock of wary, weary newcomers? 
Was your soul broken into submission? Or was the journey to the land of milk and honey punctuated by gifts of serendipity, blessings and grace? Did the face of God show himself through breathtaking ruby sunsets, through clear, crisp nights illuminated by the Shekinah glory of the North Star? Dear great-great-grandfather, I now sit here in the oblivious privilege of my relative abundance, safety, and comfort, and wonder, what message did the Holy Spirit give you to keep you moving forward? And do you ever imagine us, your progeny, your legacy, your curious descendants living up here decades later, becoming poets, parents, professors, lawyers? Did you foresee where your courage would land us, would lead us all. Here, from this vantage point of hindsight, I offer this poem in gratitude as testament to the pilgrimage that led to my becoming what I now am, a fourth generation black Canadian, now strong, now free, living on this true north stolen land. Thank you, and I'm sorry that the letters you had to ask someone else to write didn't offer you absolution, didn't help you find your wife. Thank you, and I forgive you for not knowing how to be a father and treating your own wounded children like chattel. Thank you, and God only knows the scars you carried over those miles, the wounds replicated in all our DNA, and the wounds you were able to heal for all of us with the power of your faith. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, don't care nothing but the righteous and the holy. This train is bound for glory, this train. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as a spoken word artist, I become fascinated with the Underground Railroad. And not just because of my own paternal ancestry, but also how that history has fed into what has now become contemporary spoken word. From the slave plantations of the Old South, to the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s, to the Black Arts Movement in the 60s, really contemporary spoken word began at the same time as my ancestors first stepped foot on North American soil. Black art and culture began as what Lewis Henry Gates called signifying, a way to use language as a means of covert resistance. Seemingly innocent spirituals, to both master and overseer, they were merely words, simple lyrics, ingenuous hallelujah ballads. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. But these words were charms, incantations chanted in secret freedom code, surreptitious melodies sung by restless slaves. Chariot became train, became a rumbling underground, echoing over plantation field of cotton, tobacco, and cane. Gospels for safety, for shouts, never mind, battle cries would leave a brother dead cold in a heartbeat. Mothers with babies strapped to their bent and ears, snapped back, sung the unrelenting sun of the old south, and men with bodies worked hard than raw till they were little more than meat and bone recounted these so-called silly spirituals to both each other and God. God, they asked for strength. Each other, they asked for directions. Where to cross over that river and where to board that subterranean northbound train to freedom. Then came the blues, belting out anguish over injustice after emancipation failed to deliver the promised land. Instead, sending clansmen who strung up to lifeless one brother after another as law enforces turned away and crosses burned till dawn. 
Dallas blues, Memphis blues. I ain't had nothing but bad news, crazy blues. Unabashed, these words laid claim to the pain of generations. Love was sought, found, then gone, gone, gone. But still our history will not be undone. And so the young entered at their peril, the guarded gates of academia, living the vision of Booker T. Washington, where scholarly success meant abandoning one's own language, meant adopting the mother tongue of Uncle Tom. Until a hunger for our own vernacular mingled with the passion of romanticism, and it got really dark. No, that's not what I meant. <laughs> mingled with the passion of romanticism. It's like fireside stories. And a new language was born. On the page, on the stages of smoky coffee houses, deep in the heart of Harlem. In this renaissance, we began to reclaim ourselves, began to own our newly found freedom to simply read and write out loud, to make love and meaning of our suffering, to live out loud word by word on our own terms. Langston Hughes left a language deep as the Euphrates that flowed into the ocean of Gwendolyn Brooks bestowing permission for preachment as Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez reloaded the literary canon with unapologetic verse fueled by didacticism and up here in the true north beyond that 49th parallel, Clifton Joseph and Lillian Allen waged a rubber dub revolution and all across the country slam and hip hop brought the acronym of rhythm and poetry back to the streets and ghetto speak became fodder for heightened verbal artistry. These are our ancestors of verse. This is our lineage and still unsung are so many who first spoke the words that birthed the language of soul speak. So, okay, so both those poems started with spirituals. And for many of us in the black community, Christianity isn't just the backbone of our faith. It's the cornerstone of our history. For me, my own journey as a Christian really began about five years ago when I was struggling with a deep depression. During the darkest night of that time, I stopped being able to find reasons to keep going. And so I fell to my knees and I said, God, if you're there and you want my life, you can have it. And it was in that moment that I suddenly understood what the phrase, Jesus saves, really meant. And since that time, my creative life has blossomed after decades of struggling with writer's block, I finally had inspiration. So I was in a workshop during COVID lockdown, and I was given a prompt by a French painter, painter named George Broke. And the quote was, art is a wound turned to light. And I thought, yeah. The light of witnessing existence makes everything beautiful again. Brings rebirth to those disowned parts of self, those shattered fragments the world is deemed unworthy. Those darkened days and tired nights of soul deep weariness become refreshed through the act of simply recording what is. What it is to be ourselves, unabashed and naked, living on this crushed ball of stardust, what it is to be us, hurtling through the universe, bouncing up against each other like ideological pinballs, at a time when the polarity of this planet has sent so many of us off on our own diametrical trajectory away from the core, when the weight of personal animosity has become crippling, when the term respectfully dis disagree is about to become extinct. In this moment, I bow down and thank God for bestowing us with the gift of creativity, for endowing all humans a life-giving method of release to the pressures of simply existing, a way to translate pain into beauty, a way to open up the valve on it all and begin to let off steam. What a gift it is to be given this moment here 
at the TEDx conference, to be invited to express all the colors of this jagged emotional palette without judgment and simply say, yes. Yes to the raw red of rage. Yes to the yellow of hope. Yes to the bruised hearted blues. Yes to unfathomable purple. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes and amen to it all. Thank you.